section four of the countess of lowndes square and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by kate fallis the countess of lowndes square and other stories by e f benson general stories chapter one the dance on the beefsteak this midsummer day the early hours of which were bathed in so serene a sunshine has ended in storm and hurly-burly only this morning the general outlook was as unclouded as is now the velvet blue of the star-scattered italian sky but this evening our very souls are driven like dead leaves before a shrivelling blast nature unsympathetic indifferent still holds on her great unruffled courses the stars wheel the north wind blows lightly from across the gulf the little ripples shed themselves in lines of phosphorescent flame naples lies a necklace of light on the edge of the sea the loveliness of the southern night is undiminished but mrs mckellar has danced on the beefsteak and she has dismissed Seraphina. To the dweller in cities or other light-minded and populous places, this may appear but the most farcical of tragedies, worthy of no more than the scoffing laugh of a passer-by. But such do not know Mrs. McKellar, nor Seraphina, nor life in Alatri. For in Alatri, as a rule, nothing happens, certainly nothing unpleasant. Our lives are as smooth as the halcyon summer seas, and it will, I am afraid, be impossible to give to any but the most imaginative reader an adequate idea of the devastating nature of the catastrophe. It will be necessary, in any case, to recount in brief the events of the last twenty-four hours yesterday afternoon we were all on fate mrs mckellar gave a party for two reasons either of which was amply justifiable the first was that the engagement of seraphina her cook to antonio her man-servant was definitely sanctioned by her and so made food for public rejoicing the second that seraphina had been with her as cook for an entire year now in a lottery servants do not as a rule stop with mrs mckellar more than a few weeks then they leave there is no dissatisfaction expressed and no public quarrel they just lose their nerve and go away but the days had added themselves into weeks and the weeks into months and before any of us knew where we were seraphina had been a year with mrs mckellar hence the party there were in fact two parties for seraphina and antonio entertained their friends in the kitchen while mrs mckellar received on the house roof she is an immense scotchwoman broad in bosom and in accent and feels the heat acutely consequently when i received an invitation for four o'clock on an afternoon in the middle of june it was clear that she must have a real desire to celebrate the event the duchess of alatri to her more intimate friends bianca came with me by special invitation her grace is a huge white campagna sheep-dog so tall that she can when sitting down put her chin on an ordinary dining-room table and eat your bread when you are not looking at rest she resembles a large rug and as such is not infrequently trodden on and when in motion she resembles nothing that i have ever seen her sole method of progression is a trot she never walks and she cannot gallop but the trot varies from a pace so surprisingly slow that she appears only to be marking time to that of the passage of an express train the other day she was investigating interesting smells in the piazza 
went out for a walk with me and so got left behind i did not miss her till i was some half mile away and looking round saw a distant white speck where the road leaves the town i whistled shrilly on my fingers and without appreciable interval she was with me she belongs not alas to me but to an american who has left the enchanted island for the summer unless perhaps it is more just to say that he belongs to her and committed her grace to my care her passions are being combed cheese and dancing this latter i discovered by a happy accident for the first afternoon that she was with me she was very sorrowful and though i ran up the stars and stripes on the flagstaff instead of the union jack wondering if this would give her the thrill of home she remained dispirited but shortly before going to bed hoping in some vague way to cheer her and being myself futile i danced round her snapping my fingers the effect was magical the rug shuffled swiftly to its feet and began gambling she jumped in the air she turned briskly round and round she took little leaps with her head down like a bucking pony she upset a small table on which was standing an open tin of biscuits and scarcely pausing to sweep up the greater part with her tongue she lurched heavily into an oleander tub on the veranda snapping the shrub off short and when about ten minutes later i sank into a chair breathless and exhausted the duchess was herself again only once when passing her old home did she show any desire to remain there and even then i had but to execute two fantastic steps down the path when she gave a sort of choking cry her apology for a bark and came after me behaving like a rocking horse so bianca and i went up the steep path to mrs mckellar's shortly after four yesterday afternoon she lives in a stucco castle with battlements there was already a tarantella going on in the kitchen seraphina is a notable dancer and bianca brightened up she said this is the place for me and brushing rudely by me trotted down the back stairs and i saw her no more so i went alone to the house-roof all alatri was there perspiring under an oriental awning which mrs mckellar had put up for the shelter of her guests it seemed calculated to concentrate the heat of the sun and to exclude all air the german doctor who has not left the island even to go to naples for nine years was talking the native dialect to a swedish painter the mysterious russian widow who plays piquet every evening with her man-cook was chattering voluble french to a circle of mixed nationality and mrs mckellar resplendent in tartan was treating bewildered listeners to the people's speech the ices had transformed themselves into a delicious fruit cream and the sugar was melting like tallow off the cakes we indulged in the usual topics the impossibility of leaving a lottery that summer the promise of a fine vintage the apocryphal shark three metres long whose dorsal fin had appeared only a few yards from the shore of the bagno the iniquity of servants in general and the conspicuous virtue of seraphina mrs mckellar in the democratic spirit that helps to make a lottery so wildly interesting had added that when the feasting in the kitchen was over and when no one wanted to eat more ice cream on the housetop the party from below should join the party up above so that we all should be one on this happy occasion accordingly after a while she leaned over the battlements of her castle gave a loud war cry and up came seraphina's party she led the way with her promesso in a state of high hilarity and all the servants of all mrs mckellar's guests brought up the rear there was no blushing possible for everybody was scarlet with heat already and we split off into domestic groups francesco sat by me and began to tell me why nobody went to mass on this name-day of st john the baptist this was interesting but on the other side of me was seraphina discussing trousseau with her mistress and the loud arresting italian of mrs mckellar only permitted me to give half an ear to the story of san giovanni 
however francesco could tell me about it again to-morrow in less distracted conditions and when the discussion about the trousseau was over i had gathered several plums un tartano di edinburgh being a fine one i left next morning i had a crisis of affairs in a lottery if one has anything whatever that must be done it like the grasshopper becomes a burden but i had several things that must be done and i was nearly crushed by the prospect in the first place breakfast was ready before i was out of bed and i therefore had to postpone shaving till afterwards this alone would have made a troublesome morning but this was far from all on coming down i found two letters that had to be answered one and i was sorry for my sins containing an uncorrected proof and while i was still prostrate from the blow francesco came in with household accounts these for the sake of morality i make it a rule to check francesco's addition is always right mine always wrong and thus it stood to reason that i should not be able to start down to the sea to bathe till nearly eleven however no britons to be balked and i marched manfully across the thirsty desert of affairs an hour in the sea and the consciousness of duty done restored equanimity and when after lunch francesca brought me coffee on to the veranda and seemed disposed to linger i remembered the half-heard story of san giovanni tell it me again i said and francesco told it the signor must know he said that in italy there are many unbaptized children and if san giovanni came to earth like the other saints on his name day he would be furious at such neglect and burn up the earth with fire god knows this and being unwilling that we should all suffer he sends san giovanni to sleep the day before his name day so that he sleeps for eight days then when he wakes up he says to god is not my name day yet and god replies o oh, san giovanni you have been to sleep and your name day is over while you slept it will not come again for another year thus it is that we do not go to mass on the day of san giovanni for where is the use if he is asleep but the priests say ah has not the signor heard the news he broke off suddenly and excitedly news i have heard no news how can i have forgotten the signora mckellar has danced on her beefsteak and seraphina is dismissed so when will she marry antonio now the two things a southern italian loves best are telling a story and causing a sensation and it was with the most exquisite enjoyment that francesco continued for both were here combined the market-boat came in from naples this morning he said and on it was a fine beefsteak for the signora salvador the carrier took it up and it so was that both the signora and seraphina were on the house-roof when he came and the signora was ordering dinner and it seems she was angry so said salvator at the cost of the ice-cream yesterday so he was ordered to bring up the beefsteak and the signora smelt it and said it was not food for dogs and salvator you know he is a sharp fellow he replied indeed it is not food for dogs meaning thereby yes i understand i interrupted francesco was getting gesticulative and he went on with the fire of a prophet then gave the signora the beefsteak to seraphina he cried and said smell it thou also and seraphina having smelt it said signora it seems to me very good at that the signora turned on her like one goaded and cried thou too art in the plot to cheat me to-day thou art no more my cook and as for the beefsteak echo and she threw it down and danced upon it with both feet together so that the roof trembled also she said many strange words in her own tongue and francesco like a true artist did not linger after making his point but turned on his heel resisting even the temptation to talk it all over and went into the house 
here was a bolt from the blue the summer had begun there would be no fresh visitors to Alatri till the winter and seraphina would be out of place all these months antonio's wages would not keep them both if seraphina was out of place and had to pay for her board and lodging with some friend and who knew whether mrs mckellar's wrath would not spread like a devouring flood and overwhelm antonio also nothing was more likely for i remembered how on the dismissal of mrs mckellar's last cook her washing had been withdrawn from its customary manipulator simply because she was the cook's cousin by marriage how then should seraphina's promesso escape already the smell of the marriage bake meats was in the air they were like to eat them with a sauce of sorrow to attempt to interfere or to reason with mrs mckellar was out of the question her nose would go in the air and she would say hoots those who had heard mrs mckellar say hoots seriously knew what fear was two days have passed after that terrible dance of death on the house roof two days of paralyzed inaction there was of course no other subject in the mouth of the folk and grave groups formed and reformed in the piazza and at morgano's and looked at the question this way and that like impotent conspirators wanting a plan of action i happened to be sitting at that cafe before dinner on the second evening and we were shaking our heads over it all when mrs mckellar herself came snorting and stamping round the corner like children detected in some forbidden ecstasy we all sank into silence she did not even sit down to enjoy her vermouth but sipped it standing with loud angry sucking noises as if it was the life-blood of seraphina we all froze under the contempt of her blue tremendous eye and then most unfairly she singled me out and pointing the finger of scorn hissed at me oh, i can find what the hail clam jamfrey of ye has been talking about she said or words to that effect and without deigning to translate this tempestuous lady swept on her course she stepped so high in her indignation that the duchess of alatri lying for coolness sake on the pavement outside thought that mrs mckellar was dancing for her and rising to her feet her grace trod a circular saracenic measure hardly pausing to swing a string-bag containing such comestibles as would be easily rendered palatable without the aid of a cook mrs mckellar turned to me again and spoke in english in order that i might understand if i were you she said i should be ashamed to keep a dog that eats as much as six christians i'll be bound be they presbyterians or roman catholics even as she spoke who should come by but seraphina herself though she had been hounded out of the casa mckellar only yesterday with every circumstance of ignominy and highland expressions seraphina sunny and incapable of rudeness gave her late employer a little smile and a little obeisance and said bueno sera signora without the smallest doubt mrs mckellar returned that smile now in a lottery i must have you know we are all great psychologists and students of character and often talk about each other's actions and the gloomy traits of character exhibited therein so that if you didn't know the seriousness of our aims you might think we were gossips but the true character of mrs mckellar who she is inside herself had always puzzled everybody no one could pull her together into any sort of personage who would pass muster in the wildest work of fiction as being conceivable why for instance did she who averted her chaste eye from the naked foot of a fisher-boy herself wear a tight silk bathing-dress that reached not quite to her knees and nowhere near her elbows was it as mrs leonard said to display the atrocity of her own figure and thereby strengthen the rickety morality of the world in general that could hardly be the case since on other occasions she laced herself so tight and wore such a killing hat and so many cairngorms and garnets that she could not be found guiltless of making a public temptation of herself 
why again by what possible psychological consistency did she revel in a game of poker and reserve the hostility of her finest colloquialisms for those who took tickets at a lottery why again but there is no use in multiplying her contradictions for she entirely consists of them but the salient point on which every psychologist's eye was pensive to-day was why she had dismissed seraphina after a year's harmonious cooperation for agreeing with salvator that a particular beefsteak did not stink never had she had such a servant as seraphina nor ever would and well she knew it some one suggested that mrs mckellar had determined to be an eater of uncooked foods and others who remembered her welter of appreciation over an ordinary mutton cutlet hardly troubled to reply to so inadmissible a conjecture as we whittled away at her the point of the discussion grew ever sharper for why had she so clearly smiled in answer to seraphina's greeting just now the idea that the smile was purely sardonic had most supporters one or two who kindly upheld the view that she was meaning to make it up with seraphina were hissed down the most obdurate alone stuck to it and had the hardihood to bet five liras that this was the true explanation of the smile and the readiness with which he found takers for that bet caused him to experience an access of prudence and to explain that he only meant to bet five liras all told and not fifty alas no one was walking in my direction and some half an hour later i went slowly home already i was beginning to regret that i had not taken more of those bets for the shrewdest analyst of motive and psychology in a lottery had been bound to confess that mrs mckellar's motives like the path of the comets that should according to all calculations periodically destroy the earth were when all was said and done completely unconjecturable no application of logic or reason of the movements of heavy bodies seemed to apply to them and for that very reason i had rejected the sardonic nature of that smile for seraphina and in the spirit of credo quia impossible had taken it for a smile of reconciliation but i stood to win five liras and who would quarrel with so enviable a conclusion especially since it implied the reinstallation of seraphina that was not a wholly altruistic consideration for leonard had said in so many words that mrs mckellar would probably attempt to seduce francesco away from my service with the lure of higher wages that was a horrible thought and i quickened my steps as i came near to my villa i heard bounding footsteps coming down the outside stairs from the front door into the garden which could only be francesco's and i wondered whether he was prancing towards me in order to communicate his wonderful good luck in going as cook to mrs mckellar at twice the wages he at present received i believed mrs mckellar like the prophet habakkuk to be capable de tout but i didn't really believe this infamy of francesco the garden door flew open and he met me with a face of mourning the signora mckellar he cried walked up with seraphina to her house through your telescope signor i saw them kissing and kissing on the roof dio why does a woman want to kiss a woman there are many strange things in this world signor saint peter he had a wife and also his wife had a mother and one day tell me about it after dinner i said and bring up the bottle of english wine the port wine which i brought from rome i have won five liras francesco si signor said francesco but the dinner is not yet quite ready for i was watching with your telescope five liras there was once a man who backed five numbers at the lotto and behold they all came out even as he had backed them he won a hundred thousand liras and an estate in calabria and dinner said i and francesco ran to the kitchen i walked on air alone that evening i had had the courage of my opinion and for once had divined mrs mckellar's mind to the extent of backing my divination for five liras 
that is a lot of money here for a stall at the cinema front row only costs one end of section four section five of the countess of lounge square and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org michelle mcfarland ballarat australia the countess of lounge square and other stories by e f benson general stories chapter two the orialists in spite of the unaccountable absence of a cabinet minister who should have sat between our hostess mrs withers and miss agnes lockett i felt that this luncheon party must be considered as perhaps the most epoch-making that had up to the present date been enticed beneath that insatiably hospitable roof never had the comet-like orbit of our entertainer ascended quite so high towards the zenith with the negligible exception of myself for whose presence there I shall soon amply account, there was not one among us, man, woman, or child, for that prodigy on the fiddle, Dicky Sebastian, in his tight colossal sailor suit was of the company, whose name was not thrillingly familiar to the great percentage of the readers of those columns in the daily press, which inform us who was in the park on Sunday, chatting with friends, or at the first night of the new play looking lovely briefly to tell the number and brightness of these stars there was a much beribboned general from salonica a girl just engaged to the heir of one of our most respectable dukedoms a repatriated prisoner from ruleben a medium possessed of devastating insight a prominent actress from a review a lion hunter not our amiable hostess but a swarthy taciturnity from east africa and the adorable agnes lockett lately created a dame in the order of the british empire in connection with secret service she had just been demobilized and as she freely admitted four years of conundrums and traps had undermined the frankness of her disposition schemes plans intrigues had become for the moment a second nature to her and she was not happy unless she was laying a trap for somebody else or suspecting quite erroneously that somebody was laying a trap for her she had also become a smooth conversational liar these things had not it may be mentioned affected her charm and her beauty finally there was myself who had no claim to distinction of any kind beyond such as is inherent in living next door to mrs withers and being honoured with the friendship of agnes lockett i had been asked by telephone just at luncheon time as I was in the act of sitting down to a tough and mournful omelette alone, and I naturally felt quite certain that I had been bidden to take the place of some guest, not the cabinet minister whom she still expected, who had disappointed Mrs. Withers at the last moment. This was confirmed by the fact that she told me in her clearest telephone voice that I had promised to come today, which I knew was not the case, and that she was merely reminding me. Obviously, then, she was in urgent need of somebody, for it was not her custom to remind all her expected guests at the very moment when they were due at her house, and my inclusion in this resplendent galaxy was certainly due to the convenient fact that, as I lived next door, I should not keep the rest of her party waiting. It is, I hope, unnecessary to add that, with the unfortunate exception of myself, every one present appeared in the informing pages of who's who so that his work and recreations were known to the reading public, and would afford a good start to the medium in case we had a séance afterwards. As the currents of conversation set this way and that, I was occasionally marooned in a backwater, and could hear what Mrs. Withers was saying to Agnes Lockett. The latter had been to the new play last night, and an allusion to it produced from our hostess a flood of typical monologue delivered in the judicial voice for which she was famous. She was a big, lean woman who radiated a stinging vitality that paralysed the timid, and as she spoke, her eyes patrolled the distinguished table with the utmost satisfaction and controlled the service. "'Yes, 
Roland Somerville is marvellous in the part, she said, and I told him he had never done a finer piece of work. But I thought Margaret had not quite grasped his conception of it. I went round, of course, to see her afterwards, and as she asked me what I thought, I told her just that. At this moment the telephone bell rang in the room adjoining, and Mrs. Withers, though continuing to analyse the play with her accustomed acumen, it had produced precisely the same effect on her as on the author of the critique in the Daily Herald, was a little distrait in manner till her parlour-maid communicated the message. Ah, that accounts for Hugh Chapel's absence, who was to have sat between us, she said to Agnes. He was sent for to the palace at a quarter past one, and is lunching there. And I ordered golden plovers especially for him. Hugh was at Priscilla's last night, looking very tired, I thought. You know him, of course, Miss Lockett. Agnes was looking a little dazed. Not yet, she said. You asked me here to meet him. Mrs. Withers made a gesture of impatience at herself. As a matter of fact, she had, in asking Agnes Lockett, told her that Mr. Chapel was coming, and in asking him, had told him that Miss Lockett was coming, thus hoping to kill two lions with one lunch. "'Of course! How stupid of me!' she said. "'Let us instantly arrange another day when you can both be here. "'Ah, do come to a little party I have on Thursday night. "'You will find Lord Marrable here too. "'He only got back from America ten days ago. "'Poor Jack! He had a terrible voyage, and he is such a bad sailor.' A look of slight astonishment came over Agnes's face, and remembering that she and Lord Marrable were old and intimate friends, I wondered whether she was surprised at this odd allusion to poor Jack, for he was known to his intimate circle as John. Personally, I had had the felicity of making him and my hostess known to each other only a few days ago, and I too wondered a little at the speedy ripening of the acquaintanceship. I did not wonder much, for I knew Mrs. Withers's friendly disposition and her tendency to allude to everybody by his Christian name. But at the moment a too rash act of swallowing on the part of Dicky Sebastian, who sat next to me, made it my duty towards my neighbour to thump him on his fat back for fear that we should never hear his violin again, and my attention was distracted. When the fishbone in question had been safely deposited on the edge of his plate, the telephone had again been ringing, and Mrs. Withers was retailing the reason for the absence of somebody called Humphrey, whose place I conjectured that I was now occupying. During the discussion of the golden plovers provided for the absent Mr. Chapel, I became aware that Agnes Lockett was being drenched and bewildered with the flood of celebrated names that was playing on her as if from some fire hose. Actors, authors, politicians, social stars, soldiers and sailors were deluging her, and, without exception, they had all been here, by their Christian names, last week, or at any rate were coming next week. Without exception, too, each of them had told Mrs. Withers, in confidence, what she now repeated to Agnes, knowing that it would go no farther. George had assured her of this. Arthur had hinted that. Jenny had thought this probable. Mordy had scouted the idea altogether. But however much they had disagreed, it was certain that they would all be here on Thursday evening, and Agnes could talk to them herself. As I listened and looked, I saw that a species of desperation was seizing Agnes. She was finding the recital absolutely intolerable. Then an idea seemed to strike her, and looking round to catch a friendly eye, she caught mine and spoke to me across the table. "'Have you seen Robert Oriole lately?' she asked in her delicious husky voice that was so unlike the canary tone of Mrs. Withers. But as she asked me this, she gave me a peremptory affirmative nod of which I could not miss the significance. I had never heard of Robert Oriole before, but I was certain that Agnes, for some reason of her own, insisted that I did know him, and accordingly I answered in that sense.' "'We went to a play together last night,' I said. "'At that precise moment, without a pang or a cry, "'Robert Oriole was born. "'The new name, of course, instantly challenged Mrs. Withers's whole attention, "'as Agnes had designed that it should. 
devoted as she was to old and celebrated names, new names that she had never heard of demanded the keenest of inquiries. "'Robert Oriole, she said. "'Who can it have been who was speaking of Robert Oriole the other day?' Agnes's brilliant smile shot out and sheathed itself again. "'Ah, who isn't talking about Robert Oriole?' she said. Much as Mrs. Withers liked appearing to know, she liked really knowing better, and surrendered. Was it Maudie? she said. I can't remember. Once against a fresh current of conversation clung to my hearing, but rather uneasily, I could catch little enthusiastic phrases in what Agnes was saying to our hostess, and wondered if I should be called upon to invent anything more about this unknown personage. I could not, a moment ago, have done otherwise than I had done, for Agnes unmistakably commanded me to say that I either had or had not seen Robert Oriole lately. I was bound, at any rate, to convey in my answer that I knew him, and so it made no particular difference as to whether I had seen him lately or not, and I had said that we had been to the play together because I had to say something, and it was clearly much more suitable at Mrs. Withers' table to have done that sort of thing. For all that I knew for certain, there might be such a person, but I strongly suspected that there was something back of Robert Oriole, as our American friends say. What that was I could not conjecture, but I felt that I was acting under Agnes's direction in some secret service. My apprehensions increased as I heard his name figuring largely in her conversation, and were confirmed when, as she passed me on her way out, she said in a secret service undertone, not looking my way as she spoke. I shall come back with you almost immediately to your house, where we must have a serious conversation. For the present, just keep your head, and remember that you know Robert intimately. Half an hour later, accordingly, we were seated together in my house. The wall between mine and Mrs. Withers's drawing-room was not very thick, and the bountiful roulades of Dickie Sebastian's violin were plainly audible. Agnes, with a flushed face, like a child who had been triumphantly mischievous, was sipping barley water, for she felt feverish with imagination. "'So that's that,' she said decisively, after a lurid sketch of what had happened. "'And it's no use regretting it. We must save all our nervous force to go through with it.' "'But what made you invent Robert Oriole at all?' I asked. "'And then why have brought me in?' I couldn't help inventing him. It may have been demoniacal possession, or more likely it was a defensive measure against my going mad, which I undoubtedly should have done if Mrs. Withers had told me any more at all of what the great ones of the earth said to her in confidence. I should either have gone mad, or taken up a handful of those soft chocolates and rubbed her face with them. So I was obliged to know some glorious creature whom she didn't know. Obliged! She knew all the real ones, so I had to invent one. Does she really call them by their Christian names? At a distance, said I. Then she ought to do it right. She called John Marrable Jack when nobody else had ever called him anything but John. And she spoke of you as Frank, whereas nobody had ever called you anything but Francis. In a week from now she will be calling my darling Robert Oriole Bob. But he really is Robbie. She put down her empty glass. That has calmed me, she said, and so now we will get to business. I must repeat all that I told Mrs. Withers about Robbie. He is thirty-one and is the most marvellous airman. He has yellow hair and blue eyes and is like the Hermes at Olympia. She thought I meant all's court. It is perfectly clear to Mrs. Withers's ferreting instincts that I am in love with him. About that you had better say, if she asks you, that we are merely great friends. He flew over to France about a week ago, piloting three cabinet ministers. They won't fly with any other pilot. That won't do, said I. I went to the play with him last night. I am not so stupid as to have forgotten that. He came back yesterday and left for Paris again this morning, carrying a new cipher to the embassy. He writes the most wonderful poems, which he composes as he is flying. She will ask for them at Bickers, said I. 
Agnes thought intently for a moment. She may ask for them at Vickers, she said, but she won't get them because they are not published. They are typewritten on vellum, and he lets his friends see them. Perhaps we had better write one or two. What is vellum? My head whirled. But what is it all about? I cried. I don't mean his poems, but himself. Why are you making all this up? She looked at me as at a rather stupid child. Now, try to understand, she said. I invented him originally to save myself from going mad, and we are making up delicious details about him to save ourselves from detection. We have both of us said that we know Robbie Oriole, and so we must know something about him. The more picturesque, the better. We must be able, I have already done so, and I'm telling you about it, to describe his appearance, his career, his tastes. If you told somebody you knew me and couldn't say anything definite about me, people would think that you didn't know me at all. It's the same with Robert Oriole. We must be able to tell Mrs Withers about him and say the same thing. You would be quite despicable if, having said you knew a glorious creature like Robbie, it appeared as if you didn't. What a delicious name, too. It came to me in a flash, and I felt as if I had known him all my life. Fancy poor Mrs Withers not knowing Robert Oriole. How bitter for her. Ah, that's your real reason, said I. Now you are serious. Not at all. That is the humorous side of it. It is to save ourselves that we have got to build up this solid, splendid presentment of our friend, and that is why I am telling you so carefully all I have said about him to Mrs Withers. When it comes to your turn, as it undoubtedly will, to describe him further, you must always telephone to me at once what you have said. Where had we got to? Oh yes, his poems. Haven't you got some joyous little lyrics in your desk which are his? Or better, some vague, morbid little wailings? Yes, that shall be the other side of Robbie, known only to his most intimate friends. To the world which worships him, he is all sunshine and splendour. But to us, his dear friends, there is another side. His grandmother was a Russian, you must remember. I think I had better write the poems. Somehow, incredibly to myself, the fascination of creating and building up and furnishing out a wonderful young man like this, who had no existence whatever, began to gain on me. Also, as Agnes had said, there was the instinct of self-preservation to spur on the imaginative faculty. There was also the pleasure of going one better than Mrs Withers, and of pretending to know intimately somebody whom nobody could possibly know. He is an orphan, I said. May he be an American? That would make him easier to get rid of than if he was English. She shook her head. Orphan, yes, she said. American, no. I can't bear American poetry, and I'm sure I couldn't write it. But his parents lived in India. They are both dead, and he hasn't got any relations whatever, which makes him so romantic and accounts for that salt soul loneliness in his poems. We will give him a home, just a little remote house by the sea in Cornwall, near St Ives. The Atlantic rolls in on the beach in front of his grey-walled garden. His poems have the beat and rhythm of the sea. I sprang from my chair. Never, never, I cried. Mrs Withers goes to Sir Ives every summer. Hmm, we will give him his home then in the Lake District, said Agnes thoughtfully. There is no beat and rhythm of the sea in his poems, but the eternal melancholy of lakes and mountains. He must have somewhere pretty far off to go when he is demobilised, as he will be almost immediately. His constant presence in London would lead to detection. Then why demobilise him? I asked. He can always be in France when it is convenient to us. She was quite firm about this. It would never do, she said. Mrs Withers might make inquiries about him from some general in the Flying Corps. Indeed, I am almost sorry he was an airman at all, but that can't be helped now. He can go to India to see his parents' graves, said I, if we want to get him out of the country for a long period. 
Yes, but he can't always be doing that. No one would make constant visits to India to see graves, however beloved were their occupants. Besides, it takes so long to go to India and back. He had much better be in his lovely home in the lakes and pay flying visits to London, here today and gone tomorrow, just giving us a new poem on vellum. That will be much more fun. Oh, a most important point. He must have some other friends besides us who are worthy of knowing him. John Marable will be a nice friend for him. John will appreciate him. I will tell a few trustworthy people about Robbie, and you must do the same. We will call ourselves the Oriolists. Mrs Withers, of course, telephoned both to Agnes and to me to bring Robert Oriel to her party on Thursday evening. But there were so many new and resplendent friends there that she did not, except for a passing moment, regret the absence of that poetic airman who was up in Westmoreland. We had each of us provided him with two or three nice friends who were in sympathy with him, but for some days after that he made no particular developments, and I began to think that, having served his purpose in protecting Agnes from insanity at Mrs Withers's luncheon party, she was losing interest in her benefactor. Then suddenly he burst out in renewed glory, for it came to Agnes's ears that in allusion to that same luncheon party Mrs Withers had said to a mutual friend that dear Aggie had told her the most wonderful things about the secret service, which she could not possibly repeat. This was sufficient to put new life and vigour into Robert Oriol. Agnes, who had never been called Aggie before, dragged me from the music room at an evening party where Dickie Sebastian was playing all that had ever been written for the violin, and recounted this outrage on the stairs. "'I have seen that woman three times,' she said. "'Once when I was introduced to her, "'once when I lunched with her on the day Robbie was born, "'and once when I didn't bring him to her Thursday evening. "'And now I am Aggie, "'and told her all about the Secret Service?' I was almost inclined to let Robbie fade away again, but now she shall see. Heavens, there she is. Dickie Sebastian had ceased for the moment, and a few straggling couples emerged stealthily from the music room, the first of whom was Mrs Withers and Lord Marrable. Mrs Withers would have been content, so it struck me, to kiss her hand to Agnes and pass on, for she had just been alluding to Aggie again. But since he came to a stop, she was obliged to wait also. He had already heard that he was a jack, and his broad, good-humoured face was a chink with merriment as he spoke to my companion. "'Hello, Aggie,' he said. "'Been talking secret service on the stairs.' "'Mr. Goodenough and I,' said Agnes carefully, "'were waiting for Robbie. "'Do go and find him and bring him here by his golden hair.' "'What? Is Robbie here?' he asked, thereby conveying to me that he was an Oriolist. "'I didn't see him. If Robbie is in a room, it's not easy to miss him. I didn't even know he was in town.' "'Of course he is,' said Agnes. "'Fancy not knowing if Robbie is in town. You might as well not know if the sun is shining,' said I fervently. "'Quite. Lord Marrable, do go back and see if he isn't there.' He and Mr. Goodenough and I are going back to his flat, and he is going to read to us. And then he is going to play the piano, and then I suppose it will be time for breakfast, before we have talked enough. Mrs. Withers rose like a great salmon fresh from the sea, and rushed at this wonderful lure. I never heard anything so improper, she said. You and, and Mr. Goodenough and Robert Oriole? My dear Miss Lockett, who is chaperoning you? Agnes's face dimpled into the most delicious smile. "'Ah, oh, we don't want any chaperone in the sunlight,' she said, as John shouldered his way back into the music room. "'Then let me drop you all at his flat,' said Mrs. Weathers. "'I have my motor here, and I'm going home now. I'm sure it is not out of the my way.' Agnes nudged me with her elbow to indicate that I had to answer this. "'Robbie's car is here. Many thanks.' I said, it's waiting for us. I saw it when I came in. And he plays the piano too? asked Mrs. Withers. Agnes laughed. Ah, I believe you know him all the time, she said, 
and mean to repeat to him all the nice things that we say about him. You know him intimately, I believe, but if you tell me that he has already sent you those three sonnets he wrote as he flew to Cologne the other day, which he promised to read to us tonight, I don't think I could bear it. Mr. Goodenough and I were promised the first hearing of them, and I believe he has sent them to you already. Indeed he hasn't, said Mrs. Withers in a social agony. I really don't know Mr. Oriel, though I am dying to. I hoped you would have brought him to my little party last Thursday. Thursday, Thursday, said Agnes. Yes, I remember. Robbie was up in the lakes. Such a pity. He would have loved it. Just the sort of party he adores. Mrs. Withers's brow, that Greek brow with a fillet of crimson velvet across it, from which depended a splendid pearl, grew slightly corrugated and made the pearl tremble. She prided herself on knowing all her engagements for a week ahead, but the recollection of them was difficult even to her. "'Sunday at lunch, then,' she said. "'Will you both come and bring Mr. Oriole? Tell him how divine it would be if he would read us the Cologne sonnets.' "'I'll tell Robbie,' said Agnes. "'But as for your chance of finding him disengaged, I couldn't promise anything. "'How his friends grab him when he appears.' I, ah, uh, there's John, I mean Lord Marrable. Well, he simply isn't here. Agnes turned to me. Ah, uh, now I remember, she said. He told me that if he couldn't get here by half past ten, he wouldn't come at all, but would just send the car for us. What time is it now? Eleven, said I. Oh, come quick then, said she. We've missed half an hour already. Lord Marrable turned to Mrs. Withers. "'Well, you and I must console ourselves with supper,' he said, "'as Robbie hasn't asked us.' It was all very well for Agnes to say that we would go quickly, but Mrs. Withers just clung. "'But wouldn't he let me come too?' she said. "'Mayn't I drop you at his door, Miss Lockett? "'And I would wait while you asked him if I might come in.' Agnes's face dimpled again. "'My dear, if it were possible,' she said. "'But with Robbie, however intimately you know him, "'you can't quite do that. "'You agree with me, Lord Marrable, I know. "'But if, if he gives me a copy of the Cologne sonnets "'or lets me make one, "'you may guess to whom I will show it, "'unless he absolutely forbids me to show it to anybody. "'How tiresome it is that you don't know him.' "'Mrs. Withers's pearl trembled again.' "'Or if lunch on Sunday won't suit Mr. Oriole,' she said. "'I have got a few people to dinner on Tuesday and Wednesday, "'and if you would bring him then, I should be more than charmed.' "'She remembered that her hospitable table was crammed on Wednesday, "'but there were two or three people who did not matter, "'and she could easily tell them that she expected them "'not that Wednesday, but the next. "'Or if he would ring me up and suggest any time,' she added. "'Agnes laughed again.' "'Too kind of you,' she said, "'and how rude of me to laugh. "'I laughed at the idea of Robbie telephoning. "'He can't bear any modern invention.' "'But he is an airman, isn't he?' asked Mrs. Withers. "'Never have I admired the quickness and felicity "'of the female mind more than at that critical moment "'which would have caused any mere man to stumble and bungle "'and leave an unconvincing impression.' There was not even the perceptible pause before Agnes answered. Ah, but Robbie says that flying is the effort to recapture bird life of a million years ago, she said. Birds and angels fly. It is not a modern discovery, but a celestial and ancient secret now being learned by us in our clumsy way. Robbie is lyrical about flying. But what bird or angel ever telephoned? Come, Mr. Goodenough, let us find that car. I forget how he reconciles himself to motoring, I said. I did not want to put Agnes in a fix, but only to delight my soul with another instance of feminine alacrity. He doesn't, said she brightly. But then you have got to get to places quickly, and you can't fly through the streets of London yet. He sounds too marvellous, said Mrs. Withers ecstatically. Sunday, Tuesday or Wednesday then, any of them. 
the discerning reader will easily have perceived by this time that both john marable and i were but wax in the inventive hands of agnes and flowed into the shapes that her swift fingers ordained for us occasionally we suggested little curves and decorations of our own which she might or might not permit but we had no independent will in the matter of robert oriole she was the architect who built this splendid temple to an imaginary deity in whose honour mrs withers his deluded worshipper swung unregarded senses of asparagus and salmon at the most we were the cognizant choir and the organ during the next weeks which included the sunday tuesday and wednesday on which mrs withers's hospitality hungered for robbie the number of oriolists greatly increased and this secret society became positively masonic in clandestine fervour and fidelity i could see at a glance without grips of any kind whether some friend or acquaintance who inquired after robbie was a mason or not for there was a gleeful solemnity about the initiated oriolist which the profane crowd lacked there were many who now spoke of him for mrs withers in her frenzied efforts to capture him and show him at her house asked every one she met if he knew robbie and her large circle of uninitiated guests and acquaintances grew almost as excited about him as she those who knew the initiates to whom these mysteries had been unveiled answered casually enough when they were applied to by mrs withers but with that gleeful solemnity which revealed them to each other one morning robbie would have been stunting over richmond or had lunched at the ritz or had been swimming in the serpentine before breakfast dropping in unexpectedly to entrance agnes with the brahms handle variations or flying back to the lakes in the afternoon and the telephone messages that passed between the houses of the initiated were cryptic and yet comprehended utterances then on an ever memorable day two typewritten copies of the cologne sonnets circulated among the elect and were secretly read in corners to the less fortunate on another day robbie must have called on me when i was out for i found his card with his address blaythwaite fell upon it when i returned he was not able to go to mrs withers's house either on sunday tuesday or wednesday but on friday when she returned from a concert at which royalty was present she found a similar card with agnes's on her table and all the account her parlour-maid could give was that miss lockett had come to the door with another gentleman whom she had not seen before for lord marrable had not previously come to the house mrs withers trembling with chagrin for she had not been presented to royalty at the concert and had missed so much more by not stopping at home telephoned to agnes at once only to learn that robbie had that moment left by air for the continent it is better to describe than to let the reader imagine for himself the state into which mrs withers was brought during these days because the imagination from excess of excited fancy would go wildly astray for she did not grow one atom distraught or deranged she became on the contrary more concentrated and businesslike than ever she telephoned daily to agnes and me to know whether robbie she always spoke of him now as robbie had got back from the continent and told us quite firmly that she would put off any other engagement in order to receive him at her house or meet him at any other house but pending that consummation she remained as regular and as resonant as a cuckoo clock and struck her social hours with the same fluty regularity she did not lose her appetite or take to cocaine or opium smoking or drown herself in the thames as imagination might expect but kept her head went up several times in an aeroplane in order to get used to it in case robbie on his return suggested an expedition and temporarily stole my copy of the cologne sonnets i am not quite sure about this but i missed them one afternoon when she had been having tea with me and found next day that in my absence she had called and gone into my sitting-room to write a note to me on my return i found the note prominently displayed and the cologne sonnets concealed in the blotting-book which i had unsuccessfully searched the evening before the case is not proved against her but certainly after that she could quote from the cologne sonnets 
then one morning even while i was wondering what made agnes keep robbie so long on the continent i was rung up by her maid and asked to go round to her at once in answer to a further inquiry it's about mr oriole sir full of some nameless apprehension i started instantly on that bright june morning feeling sure that at the least robbie was the victim of some catastrophe i was even prepared to learn that robbie was dead though i could not form the slightest conjecture as to what had led to this sudden demise or was robbie engaged to be married and had we to arrange about an elusive female of mysterious charm and antecedents well it was not that but it was even worse for agnes was engaged to john marrable who with the selfishness of his sex insisted that robbie should die he was with her and put his case agnes really seemed more taken up with robbie than she was with him and he demanded her undivided affection for her part she wanted to leave robbie on the continent for future emergencies and promised not to think about him but john objected to that his head he told us with a glance at her was too full of other things and he could not trust himself not to give the whole affair away by some inadvertence of happiness and pride that glance settled it agnes took a half sheet of paper and wrote on it for a few minutes in silence i will send it to the principal morning papers she said and john shall pay for it listen will this do oriole on the seventeenth instant very suddenly at mannheim robert only son of the late william and margaret oriole of karachi india aged thirty one deeply lamented no flowers we will grieve not only find strength in what remains behind that appeared next day and i do not suppose that anybody lamented him more deeply than mrs withers she sent agnes and me charming little notes of condolence and quoted from one of the cologne sonnets and asked if those touching lines in the notice of his death were by him a week or two later i sat next to mrs withers at dinner and mr chapel was on her other side of course you knew dear robbie oriole mr chapel she said what a loss to poetry are not those cologne sonnets the finest in your opinion since keats i was privileged to have a copy of them you agree with me do you not mr goodenough do you remember that marvellous one beginning the clouds weep westwards under the scurrilous sky i hugged myself over not asking who had given her that privilege and sadly assented she proceeded to talk to both of us as her manner was at the dinner table with an intuition wrong in itself but so excruciatingly right in general direction that it made me catch my breath yes those sonnets she said how amazingly feminine they are both in their tenderness and bitterness or perhaps all i mean is that women will always appreciate them more than men when i say them over to myself as i so often do i seem to see robbie reading them to aggie lockett certainly i thought when she first spoke to me about robbie that she was absolutely devoted to him indeed it gave me a little shock when i saw to-day that she was to marry jack marrable this was almost incredibly wonderful for mr chapel was one of our most fervent orialists it was as full of points as a hedgehog i could not count them all then he turned on me the usual look of gleeful solemnity and i knew we both wondered who would be the first to tell aggie poor robbie he said i never knew anybody the least like him he will be a sacred memory to us will he not mrs withers shook her head regretfully smiling the last time he called she said i was not at home of course if he had only told me he was coming i would have thrown over any engagement to be there but as you may not know he would never use a telephone it will always give me a little heartache to think that i was not there the last time mr chapel let his eyes wander admirably before he caught mine again it is only human to feel that he observed in the best style end of section five
Section 6 of The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. General Stories, Chapter 3 In the Dark. Reginald Case, newly promoted to the rank of captain in the 43rd Native Cavalry of the Indian Army, was picking his way back to his bungalow by the light of a somewhat ill-burning lantern from the regimental mess-room where he had dined. It was early in July. The long-delayed rains had broken at Haziri in the central provinces ten days before, and it was an imprudent man who would venture on a mere field path like this at night without some illumination for his steps, lest, inadvertently, he might tread on a meditative and deadly corite with murder behind its stale small eyes, or step on the black coils of some hooded cobra. Only a few days before, Case had found one such in the bathroom of his bungalow, curled up on the mat within a few inches of his bare foot when he went there to bathe before dinner, and he had no desire to give his nerves any further test of steadiness under such circumstances. Today there had been a break in the prodigious deluge, and all the afternoon the midsummer sun had blazed from a clear sky, causing all vegetable things to sprout with magical rapidity. This path, which yesterday had been a bare track over the fields, was now covered with springing herbs. The parade ground, which for the last week had been but a sea of viscous mud, was clad in a mantle of delicate green blades, and the tamarisks and neem trees were studded with swelling buds among the dead and dripping foliage of the spring. A similar animation had tingled through the insect world, and, as Case passed across the couple of fields that lay between the mess-room and his bungalow, a swarm of evil flies dashed themselves against the glass of his lantern. Overhead, since sunset, the clouds had gathered densely again across the vault of the sky, but to the east an arch of clear and starlit heavens was dove-coloured with the approaching moonrise. Against it, the shapes of silhouetted trees stood sharp and black in the windless and stifling calm. It was a night of intolerable heat, and his two bulldogs, chained up in the veranda of his bungalow, with their dinner lying untouched beside them, could do no more by way of welcome to him than tap languidly with their tails on the matting in acknowledgment of his return. His bearer, not expecting him to be back so soon from the mess-room, was out, and he had to wait on himself, pulling out a long chair and table from his sitting-room, and groping for whisky and soda in his cupboard. The ice had run out, and after mixing and drinking a tepid peg, he went back into his bedroom and changed his hot dinner-clothes for pyjamas and slippers. Cursing inwardly at the absence of his servant, he lit his lamp with a solitary match that he found on the table, and came out again into the veranda to think over, with such coolness as was capturable, the whole intolerable situation. At first his mind hovered, circling round outlying annoyances. He was dripping at every pore in this dark furnace of a night. The prickly heat covered his shoulders with a net of unbearable irritation. He had just lost heavily for the tenth successive evening at auction bridge. His liver was utterly upset with the abominable weather. The lamp smelled. Mosquitoes trumpeted shrilly round him. Here, more or less, was the outer and less essential ring of his discontent. To a happy and healthy man, such inconveniences would have been of little moment, but in his present position they seemed portentously disagreeable. Then, his mind, still hovering, moved a little inwards round a smaller and more intimate circle, 
surveying the calamities of the past six weeks. He had killed his favourite pony out pig-sticking. He was heavily in debt, and this morning only he had been talked to faithfully and frankly by his colonel on the text of slackness in respect of regimental duties. But still his mind did not settle down on his central misfortune. Instinctively it shrank from it. Thick and hot and silent, the oppression of the night lay round him. Now and then one of his bulldogs stirred, or an owl hooted as its wings divided the motionless air, while, farther away, in the bazaars of Haziri, a tom-tom beat as if it was the pulse of this stifling and feverish night. The clouds had grown thicker overhead, and every now and then some large drop of hot rain splashed heavily on the dry earth, or hissed among the withered shrubs. Remote lightning winked on the horizon, followed at long intervals by drowsy thunder, and to the east, in the arch of sky that still remained unclouded, a tawny half-moon had risen, shapeless through the damp air, and illuminating the vapours with dusky crimson. Once more, Case splashed the tepid soda water over a liberal whisky, still pausing before he let his mind consciously dwell on that which lay as heavy over it as over the gasping earth, this canopy of cloud. The veranda where he sat was broad and deep, and two doors opened into it from the bungalow. One led into his own quarters, the other into those of his brother officer, Percy Oldham. He was away on leave up in the hills, but was expected back tonight, and Case knew that, before either of them slept, there would have to be a talk of some kind between them. A year ago, when they had taken this bungalow together, they had been inseparable friends, so that the mess had found for them the nicknames of David and Jonathan. Then, by degrees, growing impalpable friction of various kinds had estranged them, and tonight, when at length Case thought of Oldham, his mouth went dry with the intensity of his hate, and at the thought of him, his mind, hovering and circling so long, dropped like a stooping hawk into the storm centre of his misery. He took from the table the letter he had found waiting for him in the rack at the mess-room that evening, and by the light of the fly-beleaguered lamp read it through again. It was quite short. Dear Case, I shall get back late on Thursday night, and before we meet I think I had better tell you that I am engaged to Kitty Metcalf. I suppose we shall have to talk about it, though it might be better if we did not. For a man who is so happy, I am awfully sorry. That is all I can say about it. She wished me to tell you, though of course I should have done so in any case. Yours truly, Percy Eldon. Case read this through for the sixth or seventh time, then tore it into fragments and again replenished his glass. It was barely six months ago that he had been engaged to this girl himself. Then they had quarrelled, and the match had been broken off. But he found now that he had never ceased to hope that when he went up himself later in the summer to the hills, it would be renewed again. And at the thought... His present discomfort, his debts, all that had occupied his mind before, were wiped clean from it. Oldham, they had talked of it fifty times, was to have been his best man. Suddenly, out of the black bosom of the windless night, there came a sigh of hot air rustling the shrubs outside. It came into the veranda where he sat, like the stir of some corporeal presence, making the light of his lamp to hang flickering in the chimney for a moment, and then expire in a wreath of sour-smelling smoke. One of his dogs sat up for a moment, growling, and then all was utterly still again. The arch of clear sky to the east had dwindled and become overcast, 
and the red moon showed but a faint blur of light behind the gathering clouds. Case had used a solitary match to light his lamp, and did not know where, in his own bungalow, he might find a box. But he could get one for certain out of Oldham's bedroom, for he was a person of extremely orderly habits, and always kept one on a ledge just inside his bedroom door. Case got up and, in the dark, groped his way across the lobby, out of which Oldham's bedroom opened, and, feeling with his hand, immediately found the box on the ledge at the foot of his bed. Standing there, he lit a match, and his eye fell on the bed itself. It was covered with a dark blanket, and on the centre of it, coiled and sleeping, like a round pool of black water, lay a huge cobra. On the moment the match went out, it had barely been lit, and, closing the bedroom door, he went out again onto the veranda. He did not rekindle his lamp, but sat, laying the forgotten matchbox on his table, and looking out onto the blackness of the yawning night. The wind that had extinguished his light had died away again, and all round he heard the heavy plump of the rain, which was beginning to fall heavily. Before five minutes were passed, the sluices of the sky were fully open again, and the downpour had become torrential. The lightning that an hour ago had but winked remotely on the horizon was becoming more vivid, and the response of the thunder more immediate. At the gleam of the frequent flashes from the sky, the trees in front of the bungalow, the road, and the fields that lay beyond it, started into colour seen through the veil of the rain that hung like a curtain of glass beads, firm and perpendicular, and then vanished again into the impenetrable blackness. He was not conscious of thought. It seemed only that a vivid picture was spread before his mind, the picture of a dark blanketed bed on which, like a round black pool, there lay the coiled and sleeping cobra. The door of that room was shut, and a man entering it would no longer find, as he had done, a matchbox ready to his hand, close beside the door. For another hour he sat there, this mental picture starting from time to time into brilliant illumination, even as at the lightning flashes the landscape in front of him leapt into intolerable light and colour. The roar of the rain and the incessant tumult of the approaching thunder had roused the dogs, and by the flare of the storm Case could see that Boxer and his wife were both sitting tense and upright, staring uneasily into the night. Then, simultaneously, they both broke into a chorus of deep-throated barking, and strained at their chains. By the next flash, Case saw what had roused their vigilance. The figure of a man, with flapping coat, was running at full speed from the direction of the mess room towards the bungalow. He recognised who it was, and now the dogs recognised him too, for their barking was exchanged for whimpers of welcome and agitated tails. Oldham leapt the little hedge that separated the road from the fields and ran dripping into shelter of the veranda. In the gross darkness he could not see Case and stood there, as he thought, alone, stripping off his mackintosh. Then, by the light of a fierce violet streamer in the clouds, he saw him. Hello, Case, he said. Is that you? Oldham moved towards him as he spoke, and by the next flash... Case saw him close at hand, tall and slim, with handsome, boyish face. "'You got my letter?' asked Eldon. "'Yes, I got your letter,' Case paused a moment. "'Do you expect me to congratulate you?' he asked. "'No, I can't say that I do. But I want to say something, and I hope you won't find it offensive. Anyhow, it's quite sincere.' I am most awfully sorry for you, and I can't forget that we used to be the greatest friends. I hope you can remember that too. He sat down on the step that led into Case's section of the bungalow. 
and in the darkness Case could hear Boxer making affectionate, slobbering noises. That kindled a fresh point of jealous hatred in his mind. Both dogs, who obeyed him as a master, adored Oldham as a friend. Hotly burned that hate, and the thought again of the closed bedroom door and the black pool on the blanket. Then he spoke slowly and carefully. I quite remember it, he said, and it seems to me the most amazing thing in the world. I can recall it all, all my, my love for you, and the day when we settled into this bungalow together, and the joy of it. I recall, too, that you have taken from me everything you could lay hands on, money, the affection of the dogs, even. Oldham interrupted in a sudden resentment at this injustice. As regards money, I may remind you, since you have chosen to mention it, that I have not succeeded in taking any away from you, he remarked. Case was not roused by this sarcasm. He could afford, knowing what he knew, to keep calm. I am sorry for having kept you waiting so long, he said, but you may remember that you begged me to pay you at my convenience. It will be quite convenient tomorrow. My dear chap, broke in Oldham again, as if I would have mentioned it if you hadn't. Case felt himself scarcely responsible for what he said. The tension of the storm, the infernal tattoo of the rain, the heat, the bellowing thunder, seemed to take demoniacal possession of him, driving before them the sanity of his soul. Perhaps you wouldn't mention it, he said, until you had sold my debt to some Jewish moneylender. In the darkness, he heard Oldham get up. There is no use in our talking if you talk like a madman, he said. The sky immediately above them was torn asunder, and a flickering spear of intolerable light stabbed downwards, striking a tree not a hundred yards in front of the bungalow, and for the moment the stupendous crack of the thunder drowned thought and speech alike. Boxer gave a howl of protest and dismay, and nestled close to Oldham while Case, starting involuntarily from his chair, held his hands to his ears until the appalling explosion was over. Rather wicked, he said, and poured himself out a dram of neat spirits. That steadied him, and, recovering himself a little, he felt that he was behaving very foolishly in letting the other see the madness of his rage and resentment. It was far better that he should lull Oldham into an unsuspicious frame of mind. Otherwise, he might suspect, might he not, that something was prepared for him in his room. Others, subsequently, if they had quarrelled, might guess that he himself had known what lay there. But it was all dim and fantastic. Then, the fancied cunning and caution of an unbalanced man who is at the same time ready to commit the most reckless violence took hold of him, and instantly he changed his tone. He must be quiet and normal. He must let things take their natural course without aid or interference from himself. The storm has played the deuce with my nerves, he said. That and the news in your letter and the sight of you coming like a wraith through the rain. But I won't be a lunatic any longer. Sit down, Percy, and try to forgive all the wild things I have been saying. Of course, I don't deny that I have had an awful blow. But, as you have reminded me, we used to be great friends. She and I were great friends, too, and I can't afford to lose the two people I really care most about in the world just because they have found each other. Let's make the best of it. Help me, if you can, to make the best of it. It was not in Oldham's genial nature to resist such an appeal, and he responded warmly. I think that's jolly good of you, he said, and frankly, I hate myself when I think of you. But, somehow, it isn't a man's fault when he falls in love. I couldn't help myself. It came on me quite suddenly. 
it was as if someone had come quickly up behind me and pitched me into the middle of it at one moment i did not care for her at the next i cared for nothing else case had himself thoroughly in hand by this time he even took pleasure in these reconciliatory speeches knowing the completeness with which a revenge prepared without his planning should follow on their heels had a loaded pistol been ready to his hand and he himself secure from detection he would probably not have pulled the trigger on his friend but it was a different matter that he should merely acquiesce in his walking in the dark into the room where death lay curled and ready to strike that seemed to him to be the act of god he was not responsible for it he had not put the cobra there i felt sure it must have happened like that he said besides as you know kitty and i had quarrelled and had broken our engagement off of course i hoped that some day we might come together again at least i know now that i hoped it but that was nothing to do with you you fell in love with her and she with you yes yes really i don't wonder indeed indeed i do congratulate you i congratulate you both oldham gave a great sigh of pleasure and relief it's ripping of you to take it like that he said i hardly dared to hope you would thanks ever so much ever so much and now do you know i think i shall go to bed i am dog-tired i had a six hours ride to the station this morning and even up there it was hideously hot case again reminded himself that he must behave naturally not plan anything but not interfere oh you must have a drink he said though i'm afraid there's no ice i'll get you a glass and soda he came out into the veranda again with these requisites oldham was stifling a prodigious yawn i'm half dead with sleep probably i shall chuck myself on my bed just as i am to save the trouble of undressing case felt his hand tremble as he put the glass down on the table i know that feeling he said sometimes when one is very sleepy the sight of a bed is altogether too much for one i dare say i shall do the same help yourself to whisky while i open the soda for you oldham drank his peg and again rose well i'm for bed he said and i can't tell you what a relief it is to me to find you like this by the way about that bit of money pay me exactly when it's convenient to you next year or the year after if you like i should be wretched if i thought you were putting yourself about over it so good night reggie he turned to go and it seemed to case that hours passed and a thousand impressions were registered on his brain as he walked down the twenty-five feet of veranda that separated the two doors of entrance that led into their quarters outside another change had come over the hot tumultuous night and as if the very moon and stars were concerned in this pygmy drama where but a single life out of the innumerable and infinitesimal little denizens of the world was involved a queer triangular rent had opened in the rain-swollen sky and a dim moon and a company of watery stars stared silently down and to case's excited senses they appeared hostilely witnessing ten minutes ago the rain had ceased as suddenly as if a tap had been turned off and except for the tom-tom that still beat monotonously in the town a silence of death prevailed the steam rose thick as sea mist from the ground above it a blurred etching of trees appeared and the roof of the mess-room the grey unreal light shone full into the veranda and he could see that boxer was sitting bolt upright on his blanket bed looking at oldham's retreating figure daisy was industriously scratching her neck with a hind leg and from the table a little pool of spilt soda water was dripping onto the ground all 
this Case noticed accurately and intently, and as yet Oldham was not halfway down the veranda. Once he hung on his step and sniffed the hot, stale air. That was a characteristic trick. He wrinkled his nose up like a dog, showing his white teeth. Once he shifted his dripping Macintosh from right hand to left, holding it at arm's length. Then, as he turned to pass into the door, he made a little staccato sign of salutation to Case with his disengaged hand. Boxer appropriated that and wagged a cordial tail in response. Eagerly and expectantly, now that he had vanished from sight, Case followed his movements, visualising them. He heard him shuffle his feet along the floor in the manner of a man feeling his way in the dark, and knew that he was drawing near to the closed bedroom door and the black interior. Oldham had said that he was very tired, that he was inclined just to throw himself on the bed and sleep, and the absence of matches and the added inconvenience of undressing in the dark would further predispose him to this. He would throw himself on the bed all in a piece, after the fashion of a tired man, and awake to fury the awful bedfellow, with the muscular coils and the swift death that lay crouched beneath its hood, which lay sleeping there. Tomorrow there would be no debt for Case to pay, no gnawing of unsatisfied hate, and for Oldham, no letter to his lady with the so satisfactory account of the evening's meeting. Then, from within, came the rattle of a turned door handle, and Case knew that the death chamber stood open. There followed a pause of absolute stillness, in which Case felt utterly detached from and irresponsible for whatever might follow. Then came the jar of a closed door, and that tore him, screaming from his murderous dreams, from which, perhaps, he had awoke too late. He found himself, with no volition of his own, running down the veranda and calling at the top of his voice. Percy, Percy, he cried, come out, there is a cobra on your bed. He heard the handle rattle and the door bang. Next moment he was on his knees in the dark lobby, clasping Oldham's legs in a torrent of hysterical sobbing. End of section six. Section seven of the Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. General Stories, Chapter 4 The False Step. Mrs. Arthur Bolney Ross when three years ago she set sail or rather set screw for england had no very clear idea of the campaign she intended to wage there though a firm determination to win it and had mentally arrived at no general plan beyond those preliminary manoeuvres which our charming american invaders usually adopt when they first effect a landing on the primitive pavements of piccadilly she had in fact taken half a dozen rooms at the ritz hotel and a box on the grand tier of the covent garden opera house but she had also for the six months preceding her expedition secretly received daily lessons on the pronunciation and idioms of that particular and as she thought peculiar dialect of the english language which was in vogue among the section of the english-speaking race with whom she intended to have dealings rightly or wrongly 
she had decided that the screaming drawl of new york which a few years before had so captivated the english upper classes and had led to so many charming and successful marriages was now out of date and would enchant no longer so instead of being content with her expressive native speech she learned with almost passionate assiduity the mumbling english diction the inaudible victorian voice which she rightly considered would be a novelty to those who had so largely abandoned it themselves in favour of a more strident utterance but she did not in mastering the victorian voice and intonation suffer her knowledge of her native tongue and its blatant delivery to wither from misuse she but became bilingual and schooled her vocal cords to either register without in the least confusing the two it was in this point that she showed herself a campaigner of no stereotyped order but one who might go far who intended in any case to go further than anybody else the idea was brilliant others before her had become more english than the english and had done well others had remained more american than the americans and had done even better but she among the immense bales of her luggage brought with her the significant little handbag so to speak she could sound american or english at will she could say without stumbling very pleased to meet your acquaintance or how are you just as she pleased and in this so it seems to her historian lay the germ of her success and also the seeds of her final and irretrievable disaster for in spite of her modulated voice and acquired idiom she remained american in thought with the regal impulses of a queen in newport in other respects she was not on her first landing different in kind from our ordinary hospitable invaders she had a real arthur bolney ross in the background who was capable of being shown and tested if so to speak she was searched but who since his mind had in the course of years become nothing more nor less than a mint out of which streams of bullion perpetually issued preferred to be left alone for the processes of production amelie was excellent friends with him when they had time and inclination to meet and it always gave her a comfortable feeling to know that arthur was in existence if they had met very often it is probable that they would have got on each other's nerves and since she had an immense fortune of her own have considered the desirability of a divorce but in the meantime amelie decidedly liked the feeling of stability which her husband gave her she did not think about him much but she knew he was there husbands she had ascertained were going to be fashionable in london this year or if not exactly fashionable were going to be worn in the manner of some invisible but judicious part of the dress like a collar belt or as amelie would have called it when she spoke american a grape girdle pearls also were worn though not so invisibly as husbands and amelie had five superb ropes of these which could be verified by anybody and never got on her nerves at all she had also among her general equipment a very excellent sort of social godmother lady brackenbury who for a remuneration that made no difference to amelie but a good deal to her was prepared to exert herself to the utmost pitch of her very valuable capabilities in the matter of bringing people to see her and in taking her to see people and in preventing the wrong sort of people from having any sort of access to her amelie was willing to put herself into lady brackenbury's hands with the complete confidence in which she would have entrusted her mouth to a reliable dentist had her admirable teeth demanded any sort of adjustment she could not have made a wiser choice there was nobody in fact among possible godmothers in london who would have been a sounder sponsor the two had met eighteen months before in new york and subsequently in the summer violet brackenbury had spent a month with her friend at her cottage at newport which exteriorly resembled an immense swiss chalet and inside was like a terminus hotel 
there on ground forever afterwards more historic than marathon had been fought the famous sixteen days war in which amelie had so signally defeated and deposed the reigning queen of the very smartest set of new york society the point to be decided of course was which of the two could give the most ludicrous extravagant and delirious parties and thus be acclaimed sovereign among hostesses amelie as challenger had flung the gauntlet in the shape of a midnight lawn tennis party with hundreds of arc lamps hung above the courts the nets covered with spangles and the lines made of ground glass faintly illuminated by electric lights beneath while by way of contrast with this brilliance a number of men dressed like mourners at a funeral with top hats and black scarves picked up and presented the lawn tennis balls to her guests in coffin-shaped trays here was a high bid for supremacy and it was felt that mrs cicero b dace would have to do something great in order to eclipse the brightness and originality of this entertainment but bright and original she was and when two nights later she gave her marvellous canary ball it was thought that her throne had not yet tottered on this occasion her admiring guests were thrilled to find that all round the walls of her ballroom had been planted mimosa trees among the branches of which three thousand canaries had been let loose after being doped with hard-boiled eggs soaked in rum and water these chirped and sang in a feverish and intoxicated manner at the end of the ball the men of the party dressed as huntsmen and armed with air-guns shot these unfortunate songsters and presented the spoils to their partners in the cotillion amelie had two answers to that the first an indignant letter printed in large type throughout the american press denouncing this massacre and the second another ball the letter mrs cicero b dace did not object to at all since it but enhanced her notoriety but she objected to the ball very much indeed since amelie's ingenious mind hit on the simple and exquisite plan of dispensing with the band and having in its place a choir of three hundred singers who in batches of one hundred at a time sang the dance tunes the effect was contagious and dancers joined in also producing as the press said the most stupendously lyrical effect since the days of sappho then mrs cicero b day sat down and thought again lighting upon the famous idea of the auction ball in which a real english duke acted as auctioneer and before each dance put up the ladies for auction to be bid for by the men who wished to be their partners but amelie swiftly sent for arthur bolney ross and he and a friend of hers who was backing her in this struggle for sovereignty continued to bid for her for so long that out of sinister compassion for her hostess she stepped down from the rostrum and refused to dance with either for fear that there should be no more dancing for anybody this completely spoiled the success of the auction ball and while mrs cicero b dace was still staggering from its failure amelie annihilated her altogether by giving her inimitable glacier ball on the hottest night of the year a refrigerating apparatus was rigged up on the walls of her ballroom and their entire surface thickly coated with real ice glass channels fringed with blue gentians were made round the margin of the floor to carry off the melting water while accomplished members of the band yodelled at intervals to carry out the swiss illusion she and the auctioneer duke whom she had captured from under the nose of mrs cicero b dace dressed in knickerbockers with a rope round his shoulder and an ice axe in his hand led the cotillion and mrs cicero b dace having in vain tried to point out that the gentians were three parts artificial flowers retired at one a m in floods of tears 
such were amelie ross's social achievements when unlike alexander the great she bethought herself that there were more worlds to conquer and decided to extend her dominions over england her godmother of course knew her history having indeed assisted at the history she had already made and on the night of her arrival at the ritz hotel dined with her there in her charming room looking over the green park before going with her to her box at the opera as regards this first appearance of her goddaughter violet brackenbury had laid her plans very carefully and explained them as they dined i have asked nobody else at all dear amelie she said because i want everybody to be wild to find out who you are and nobody will be able to say curiosity is the best sauce of all amelie became thoroughly american for a moment my she said don't you mean that your folk over here haven't seen hundreds and hundreds of pictures of me in the papers probably not one my dear and i've only told one woman that you are coming you are going to burst on everybody to-night you and your lovely face and your six feet of height and your wonderful hair and your wonderful pearls and the most wonderful gown that you've got i want all london for an hour or two to be wild to know who you are and i have told the box attendant to take your name off the door and not to let anybody in between the acts afterwards i shall take you to the dance at alice middlesex's which luckily ever so luckily is to-night she is the one person i have told the duchess of middlesex asked amelie yes and she is quite certain to ask you if you know lady crichton that dreadful countrywoman of yours who is climbing into london like a monkey and hopping about it like a flea she tried to patronize alice and alice won't get over it either in this world or the next so tell her that lady crichton is not received in new york which i believe is the case isn't it and look very much surprised at the idea of knowing her i can't tell you how important that is amelie frowned slightly but elsie crichton telephoned me half an hour ago she said asking me to lunch with her to-morrow to meet it doesn't matter whom she asked you to meet if she asked you to meet the entire royal family you would be wise to refuse you don't want to climb into london on the top of a hurdy-gurdy my what's a hurdy-gurdy asked amelie whose english lessons had not taught her that word hurdy-gurdy street organ it doesn't matter you don't want to know people if you understand you want to make people want to know you my plan is not that you should climb up but that you should spread down amelie instantly caught this i see she said i'm to begin at the top but elsie crichton said there was a prince coming to lunch to-morrow i thought that was a good beginning not so good as the crichton woman is bad did you accept by the way why yes then telephone to-morrow exactly at lunch-time to say you are ill and lunch with me very obviously downstairs in the restaurant in fact it couldn't have happened better it will mark you off very definitely from her and her crowd i don't mean to say that there are not charming people among it but it would never do to enter london under her wing perhaps just at present darling you had better ask me before you accept invitations it is so important to cut the right people amelie was completely cordial over this i expect that is what i have got to learn she said and now for to-night will my dress do lady brackenbury regarded this admirable costume and shook her head no i don't think it will she said it is lovely but you want something more arresting you with your wonderful complexion can stand anything orange now haven't you got a hit in the face of orange i want everybody to be forced to look at you and you'll do the rest you see i have made myself as plain and inconspicuous as possible to act as a foil it is noble of me but then i am noble and all the pearls please just all the pearls with the big diamond fender on your head 
to-morrow at the french embassy you shall wear the simplest gown you've got and one moonstone brooch price three and sixpence such was the opening of amelie's amazing campaign the incidents and successes of which followed swift and bewildering under violet's capable guidance she began not by collecting round her that brisk and hungry section of well-born london which is always ready to sing for its dinner and by giving huge entertainments to bring together a crowd at all costs but by attracting and attaching a small band of the people who mattered lady brackenbury knew very well that even in the most democratic town in the world certain people not necessarily princes or prime ministers were large pieces in the great haphazard game of chess the crowd meantime after whom amelie secretly hankered would only get more eager to be admitted in particular lady crichton starved for her entry she asked amelie to dine any tuesday in june when she was giving her series of musical parties but amelie found to her great regret that she was engaged on all those festive occasions but she gave a musical party herself london was prey this year to a disordered illusion that it liked music and melba and caruso sang there informally so it seemed just happening to sing to not more than fifty people who sat in armchairs at their ease instead of elbowing each other in squashed and upright rows in vain did lady crichton spread an assiduous report that the artist had sung out of tune and that the peaches were sour every one knew that she had not been there and that she alluded to another sort of fruit violet brackenbury was successful in persuading amelie not to send any account of this brilliant little affair to the papers and to refuse all scraps to the writers for the press but she was careful to provide for a far more telling publicity gradually craftily a reef at a time violet allowed her friend to let out her sails she left her flat at the ritz and rurally installed herself in a spacious house in the middle of regent's park there was a big field attached to the house and yielding to a severe attack of americanism which she thought it might be dangerous to suppress violet permitted her to give a haymaking party of the newport type hay was brought in from the country and scattered over the field and mixed up with roses and gardenias while the guests on arrival were presented with delightful little ebony pitchforks with silver prongs or cedarwood rakes but this symptom caused her a little uneasiness for it was obvious that amelie thought her haymaking party a much brighter achievement than the previous concert the expansion continued amelie and her friend strolled into christie's one morning and found a tussle going on between two eminent dealers over the possession of a really marvellous string of pearls at a breathless pause after the first going that followed a fresh bid amelie said in her most ringing american voice i guess i'll sail in right now and began bidding herself the crowd of dilettante london which delights in seeing other people spend large sums of money parted for her and she moved gloriously up the auction room and took her stand just behind one of the mosaic little gentlemen who wanted the pearls so badly the recognition of her spread through the place like spilled quicksilver and the auctioneer with an amiable bow caused the pearls to be handed to her for inspection with them still in her hand as if it was not worth while returning them to the tray she sky-rocketed the price by three exulting bids the third of which was as a fire hose on the ardour of her competitors her cheque-book was fetched from her car outside and she left the room a moment afterwards having drawn her cheque on the spot pausing only to clasp the pearls round her neck and violet with a strange sinking of the heart 
felt as if her pet tiger cub had tasted blood again after the careful and distinguished diet on which she had been feeding it amelie had a fancy to leave london early in july and give a few parties at an immense house she had taken near maidenhead for the month she had had some gondolas sent over from venice with their appropriate gondoliers and london found it very pleasant to float about after dinner while the excellent string band played in an illuminated barge that accompanied the flotilla exciting little surprises constantly happened such as the arrival one evening of artists from the grand guignol who played a couple of thrilling little horrors in the ballroom while on another night the great reynolds picture belonging to the duke of middlesex was found to have put in an appearance on the walls amelie said that it was her birthday present to her husband and made no further allusion to it the frame had gone to be repaired and it was draped round in clouds of silvery grey chiffon that extended half over the wall and had violet brackenbury known the outrage that her friend had planned the frenzy of suppressed newportism that was ready to break forth it is probable that she would gladly have returned the cheque which she had that morning received from amelie as it was she felt wholly at ease and inclined to congratulate herself on the unique and signal character of amelie's success never before so she thought had a woman so dominated the season never certainly had one of her countrywomen so mattered and all this with the exception perhaps of the haymaking party and the incident of the pearls at christie's had been gained in quiet unsensational ways and lulled to content she did not realize that the spirit that inspired the queen of hostesses was ready to flare up like an access of malarial fever poor unsuspecting godmother who fondly believed that those gondolas from venice those grand guignol artists from paris this gem of reynolds pictures were a safety valve not guessing that they were but as oil poured on the flame the cotillion that night was to begin at twelve amelie was leading it herself with one of the princes and the big ballroom was doubly lined with seated guests when on the stroke of twelve she entered dressed in exact facsimile of the glorious reynolds as she advanced with her partner into the middle of the room the band in the gallery struck up and simultaneously a tongue of fire shot through the flimsy draperies round the picture instantly enveloping it in flames the canvas blistered and bubbled and in ten seconds the finest reynolds in the world was a sheet of scorched and blackened rag the crowd leaped to its feet but before the panic had time to mature the cause of it was over there was nothing inflammable within range of the swiftly consumed chiffon and only little fragments of burned-out ash floated on to the floor but the fervent and instantaneous heat had done its work then for a moment there was dead silence and Amelie's voice was heard in its quietest, most English tones. Oh, isn't it a pity, she said. Then arose a sudden hubbub of talk, drowning the sound of the band, which, at a signal from Amelie, had started again. Violet stood with her friend before the blackened canvas next morning in the empty room, drawing on her gloves. "'I don't think you understand yet the effect of what you've done,' she said. "'No one doubts that the fire was intentional, and—and and I think that Lady Crichton will be of more use to you in the future than I can possibly be.'" End of Section 7